Nous allons commencer la quatrième conférence, la dernière de la journée. C'est Mme Docteur Laura Sainte Sixto, qui vient de l'Université de Galilée. Merci de notre invitation avec grand plaisir à commencer la conférence pour les bénévoles, pour les bénévoles, pour la langue d'éducation, pour les enfants. Donc, euh, une activité très, 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 très euh, intéressante. Donc, euh, Mme Sixto, vous êtes la bienvenue. children are geniuses, but we will agree that a child who's born at birth is not going to talk, and a child who's born at birth exposed to sign language is not going to be signing in full sentences. But only nine to ten months later, and certainly by 12 months, that child now has their rudimentary phonology upon which they will build all the words or signs in their native language. They have rudimentary syntax. They have their first word. They understand a rich array of meanings. They're communicating gesturally with very rich intentional acts. 
They understand that objects persist in time even when they can't see it. So children know an extraordinary amount by 12 months. And it's been called the miracle of human language. <coughs> How is it that our species gets from the moment of birth to 12 months old? How do they get there? What is in the environment? And what are we built with biologically that allows us to arrive at that point? So let's just take a moment and look at the speech signal that a child's getting. <coughs> If we look at the actual physical characteristics of a speech signal, I am not saying words now at all. All my mouth is doing is sending spindles of air through the air. This touches many of your ears and turns it into the sensation of meaning, but it's your human brain that gives the meaning. The meaning is not in the signal. Same thing if you're exposed to sign language. The visual signal hits your ear. Sorry, excuse me. It hits your eye. And your brain turns the visual sensations into meaning. And it's the meaning is in your brain. I'm just trying to emphasize, it's not out in the physical world. The meanings that we have, that we see, are coming from a construction in the human brain. So, from this very complex signal, hearing children pull out a finite set of humans. So from this blur of sounds, they have the capacity to find the phonetic unit, the small set of meaningless units from which they will build all the words in their language. That capacity that we know is online in utero, that capacity allows the child to discover words in the stream, the whoosh of sounds that are bombarding its ear. When the child finds the word, that allows the young reader at around three years old to begin to decode the black squiggly lines on the page and to, to attach sound units to the units on the page en route to discovering the meaning of text or print. Now here's the puzzle. <coughs> so the hearing child, by the time they're about three, can see the black squiggly lines on the page and can turn that into sounds that go with the black <coughs> squiggly lines. And they can use that as the bridge to meaning. So the question has been, what about the deaf child? For four decades, many professionals have looked at the young deaf child and assumed the poor deaf child, they'll never read. Sound is important to reading. They'll never achieve healthy, good reading. Well, what our research has found is that's fundamentally wrong. The young deaf child who's exposed to sign language, their brains are also segmenting the visual stream and finding the small, meaningless hand units that make up a human sign language. Their brain literally sets up a phonology but it's a silent phonology. It's structurally identical. It's structurally identical to what the hearing child does with sound. This is a revolution in our understanding of the human brain. It's a revolution in our understanding of the reading process. Sound is not important for reading. Phonology is and all world languages, including all sign languages, have 
seg a segmental level that we now understand to be a real phonology in the human brain. So, if we take these phonological units that children have in sign language, and if we use that in the instruction of reading, just the way we use sound for the hearing child in the instruction of reading, the young deaf child will be masterful at their reading. So that's the first puzzle. Given that that's the case, why isn't all, why aren't all children reading well? Why isn't every deaf child reading absolutely well? Here's the reason why. In order to have lifelong language and reading advantages, there are two things our species needs. It's a biological requirement. It's not optional. Number one, the species, our species, our human species, needs to be exposed to a natural language early in life. Number two, our species not only needs to have regular language patterns early in life, our species needs to have social interactions in the language early in life. If we have these two components, then the child can have lifelong language, reading, and academic success. So what's, what do we have? What kind of situation do we have? The challenge to what we now know is important for human biology is that many young children do not have rich early life experience. Many children don't have it. And there are lots of reasons why. We now know from huge studies in different parts of the world, in particular one study that's received a lot of attention in the United States, is that children who come from different socioeconomic status can have very <coughs> limited language input spoken to them. One study in the United States that President Obama has been very interested in, it's a study out of Chicago. They studied hundreds of children from very low socioeconomic background. And they found that the average four-year-old child from a low socioeconomic background, as compared to children from higher socioeconomic background, have a difference, a difference in the input to the child of 30 million word difference by the time they're age four. 30 million words less than a child from a stand, you know, a typical, middle class home. So this is a devastating effect of minimal language input, a devastating effect. We also know that children who are late exposed to bilingualism also show signs of not having had the richness of early exposure to two languages. And third, young deaf children the young deaf visual learner is one of those children who are at risk, at risk for the, the damage that comes from having reduced language input in early life. Now the young deaf child really has a worse situation. The young deaf child is worse because in some instances they have no input for the first year of life. And if they are going to have cochlear implants, and in certain medical contexts, those medical contexts that advise don't expose your child to sign language because somehow it might hurt the cochlear implantation, these children are without natural human language input for about two years of their life. And we see the effects forever. So let's consider.
consider why are we still withholding sign language from young deaf children? What are some of the beliefs in society that would motivate this? Okay, so let's consider these beliefs. So in the history of the study of sign language, we have several bursts. The first burst of research and celebration and recognition of the language came from theoretical linguists. And the theoretical linguists said sign languages are real languages and provided a, a description of the grammars. And the scientific world embraced that and said, bravo, yes, sign languages are real language. They're real linguistic systems and they're comparable linguistic systems to spoken language. Then we have in the, this, this was begun in the 50s and 60s. And then in the 70s, there was a cultural explosion. And the world applauded and said, deaf people have a real culture. And they said, yes, they have a real language and a real culture. However, there has been a persistent belief that somehow sign languages are biologically inferior. So the Scientific community has accepted sign languages are real languages for linguistic grounds. They've accepted that sign languages are real languages on cultural grounds. They have fundamentally rejected that sign languages are real languages on biological grounds. And what, what are some of the views that you've probably all heard? They'll say, oh, yes, that's true. Sign language is a real language, or yes, yes. Yes, that's true, sign language has a real culture. However, we all know speech is special. How many of you heard speech is special? How many of you heard speech and sign are not biologically equivalent? And also, sign language is biologically inferior. Sign language exposure will hurt the speech development of a child. Has anyone heard, heard those views? I've certainly heard those views, and I've heard those views when I've presented scientific papers. People say, oh, yes, that's true, yes, we understand. However, we all know speech is better. So this is a hypothesis. In science, what we do is we take the claim, and then we evaluate it. So I'm going to invite you to come with me. We're going to go on a 40-year journey of research into the biological foundations of human sign languages. And together, we're going to look at the claim and then evaluate it in light of the data that we've collected over 40 years. Number one, let's take a look at the claim that uh, sign languages are somehow biologically inferior. Now, before we turn to that, there's one more piece of information I want you to hold in your mind as to why there's been so much resistance to seeing sign languages as equal. One of them just has a fear of bilingualism. So we have on one hand, there are uh, complicated controversies about sign language and biology. On another hand, we have complicated views of bilingualism. And then you put them together and you get a kind of double whammy. You have sign views that sign language is somehow inferior, biologically inferior, intermixing with views about bilingualism as somehow hurting the child. Too early exposure might hurt a child, might confuse them, might delay their development of language. So you have these two thought processes, these forces that are colliding together to make our challenge to have the world see the research even harder. So on one hand, there's a thought that early exposure to sign will hurt a child's learning to read. On the other hand, we have that early exposure to sign, and this is a key one, we'll talk about this at the end. This one is that early exposure to sign language will hurt the child's auditory brain tissue development, that somehow early exposure to sign will interrupt the normal functions of the auditory tissue and prohibit 
the child from ever learning spoken language, that that will interfere. <laughs> In fact, the claims are even stronger. The cr claims of that early exposure to sign language will colonize the brain tissue that was previously dedicated for sound. And so we'll evaluate whether or not there's evidence to support this. OK, so let's start with the first one. Together, we'll test the hypothesis that early exposure to sign language and um, uh, is a, a, not a typical case for the brain. We're going to test the hypothesis as follows. That hearing and speaking, <laughs> the development of the capacity to speak and the development of the capacity to hear are the brain mechanisms that are driving human language acquisition. So one of the things we see in spoken language acquisition is that children exposed to sign language, is that children, uh, I'm sorry, is that children exposed to spoken language have these fascinating maturational milestones. You know children start with babbling, then they start with their first words, and then they start with their first sentences. And the developmental milestones have been regarded as being the cause of the maturation of the mechanisms to talk and the maturation of the mechanisms to hear. So on that hypothesis, we should predict that the child exposed to sign language should have deviant milestones. So let me just step back and make sure you're with me on this point. The view in science was that the maturation of the mouth muscles and the maturation of the auditory pathways was the motor, the machine, that pushed itself out onto human development in spoken language acquisition. That it was the cause of why a child reaches the babbling, then the first words, then the sentences. That that was what caused the occurrence of the behavior and its timing. So if you take the brain and you strip it of sound, and you only give it the hands, that child should learn language in a deviant way. And that's not what we found. When you compare children exposed to sign language from signing homes and children exposed to speech, the children achieve every single milestone in human language acquisition on the identical timetable. And here we have Children exposed to sign language begin babbling on their hands. At the same time, children who are exposed to speech begin to produce their babbling. And up the developmental uh, scale, we see no difference between children who are exposed to sign language from birth and children who are exposed to spoken language. So here we have a challenge for that view. It cannot be that the development of the mouth and the ears are driving normal language acquisition. Because the child exposed to sign language, who's not having maturation of auditory pathways and maturation of oral facial control of speaking, have entirely normal acquisition of human language on the identical timetable. And so that's the first challenge. Now we're going to look at a second challenge. What about a child who's born hearing, and the child is exposed to spoken language and sign language from birth? They're effectively bilingual. If that child is biologically programmed for speech, for spoken language acquisition, that child should turn its head from sign and glean any morsel of sound it could get. They should show, a little baby should show a preference for speech. The development should be asynchronous. The timing should be off. They should be nice and normal in speech and the sign might trail behind. Or the reverse, but we shouldn't expect to see an equivalence if the view is that speech is driving normal acquisition. And what do we find? That's false. 20 years of studies have shown that children exposed to spoken and sign languages from birth achieve every milestone on the same timetable as is universally seen in the species. 
There's no bias towards speech. The children don't favor speech. They learn each milestone in sign on the same timetable as the milestone in speech. It's time locked. It's coming from the human brain. It's not coming from the modality. It's not coming from the hands or the tongue. The timing is coming from the human brain. So I'll show you one example of this child. on the same timetable. There's nothing deviant about their acquisition of language in sign and nothing deviant in spoken language. So what about a very dramatic situation? What about children who are born hearing and not exposed to spoken language? What's the prediction for that group? If the human species is biologically programmed for speech and sound, hearing children who were born into deaf homes who have no spoken language input should have deviant language. They should be deviant in every way. They should be socially deviant, cognitively deviant, linguistically deviant. We should mess up the whole developmental system by withholding speech, which is ostensibly, hypothetically, what is key in human language acquisition. And what do we find? These children, so they're hearing children who have had no spoken language input. It's very dramatic. They have had no spoken language input. They reach every milestone in human language acquisition in sign on a normal, healthy, maturational timetable. I will now show you an 18-month-old hearing child, 18 months old. She has never been exposed to spoken language. She has only been exposed to sign language. Her development, I followed her from four years old when she was finally put into a hearing school. This child's language acquisition, actually there are many of these children, these children achieve normal acquisition. They're entirely normal. It's as if they're in monolingual French-speaking homes or monolingual Russian-speaking homes or monolingual Italian-speaking homes. The children's brain takes sign language input and treats it like it's a normal language. They achieve every single milestone of sign language on a normal, healthy, maturational timetable. So let's take a look at one example. This is, child is actually in my laboratory, and we're, asked, we're in a typical naming paradigm. If you remember your 18-month-old, you hold up an object, you say, what's this? The child names. You can see the child turn to her mom to ask for confirmation. <coughs> and the mom says, yes, that's the, it's a brush. And uh, you'll see that interaction on the side here. This child is now quadrilingual, French, English, ASL, and LSQ. So having seen that the maturational timetables are entirely normal, the whole curve, the developmental curve is so normal, we then took the beacon 
and went back to the beginning of human language acquisition in production. Clearly, babies are receiving language through their eyes or receiving language through their ears from, a ver from very early in life. But what about production? The universal milestone in the production of language is when a baby's about six months and they begin to babble. The world thought those children, when our children babble, they thought that that is the universal onset of language production. It's uncontroversial. It also was assumed that the cause of babbling, ba, 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 da, 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 it was assumed that the cause of that was the maturation of the mouth. Everyone assumed that that was determined and driven by the maturation of the capacity to control the oral facial region in the production of words. So that would predict that if you have a deaf child and you strip away sound and you strip away speech production, babbling shouldn't happen. Deaf children shouldn't babble. And one of the major discoveries in science was that that's wrong. Profoundly deaf children babble on their hands just like a hearing child babbles on their mouth. And it taught us to pull apart speech and language. Speech is not language. Language is in the brain. If you get exposed to speech, you'll talk. If you get exposed to sign, you'll sign. If you get exposed to both, you'll do both. Because it's not the medium. It's the brain that's controlling it. So I'll give you, I'll just let you see these children. Uh, these children, the discovery was that these children babble on their hands. These, uh, it's uh, uncontroversial now. It's been replicated. Uh, and it was, uh, they were published in very respectable journals, the highest tier that we know in science. And so these are findings that have really challenged the scientific community's view of what is human language. Is it talking? or is it patterns that we have and that we decode in the human brain. So this is a, this is a uh, nine month old deaf child who's babbling and this is a six month old hearing child exposed only to sign language who's babbling. And both of these demonstrated that Phonology is independent of sound. What the child is doing when they're babbling is they're extracting out little baby phonetic nuggets from the world around them. Human language is it's a, one of the paradoxes that we know. It's a profound paradox. <coughs> Human language is potentially infinite in its expression of semantic meaning. We, there's an infinite amount that we can express. Yet the extraordinary thing about human language is that it's constructed. We build language from only a tiny set of about 45 basic units. And those basic units we combine and recombine and recombine to make all the words and all the sentences in sign language or in spoken language. And the species, our species, starts with the small little bite-sized chunk called phonetic unit. And we do it on the hands if we're exposed to the hands, and we do it on the tongue if we're exposed to the tongue. It's the brain that needs the phonetic unit and we'll push it out onto the hands of the child's given sign, and push it out onto the tongue if they're given speech. And that, so that's what I mean when I say that phonology is independent of sound. That's a stunning finding. It's a finding that teaches us that deaf children's brains are being built just like the hearing child's brain. And we must use their knowledge in the same way we use a hearing child's knowledge of phonetics to map onto the black squiggly lines on the page, we must use the deaf baby's knowledge of phonology 
as the bridge to help them learn reading. And if we do that, you will have powerful readers, academic success, and language success. So let me go on how we continue to test this. The next step, after finding this with children, we raised a bold hypothesis. We're seeing the same development over developmental time. We're seeing the same units get pushed out onto the hands. Maybe, just maybe, the brain tissue that's responsible for sign language and spoken language is the same. Now, let me say again, this was a very bold hypothesis. Sign languages are made with the hands. Many people said they were gesturally based. So that means they should have been over in the right hemisphere. Spoken languages are made with sound. And those sounds are, co are controlled in the left hemisphere. So everyone said, no, sign languages are not real languages. They are going to be biologically different. Sign languages should be in the right hemisphere because they're gesture. Spoken language should be in the left hemisphere because it's a real language. And that's how it should work out. So we tested that. We took profoundly deaf people. I'll show you, uh, we can just, uh, these are some of the brain studies that we did. We took profoundly deaf people and we put them into brain scanners. And we took hearing people and put them into brain scanners. And we had hearing people who spoke French, hearing people who spoke English, deaf people who used ASL, and deaf people who used LSQ. We wanted to be sure that we were really doing a cross-linguistic study. We weren't going to find something that was peculiar or special to ASL or peculiar or special to English. We wanted to look, or French or whatever, we wanted to make sure that these were strong findings about the human brain. And what we found, let me show you, is um, we presented deaf and hearing people with these meaningless phonetic units on the hand. This is as if we said ba, pa, ta in English, or um, the similar phonetic units in French. These are meaningless phonetic units, meaningless. <coughs> and they're silent. There's no sound. And what did we find? When deaf people looked at these meaningless phonetic units, the tissue in their brain that we have thought for 125 years was the exclusive site for the processing of speech sounds, we found that tissue used in deaf people. It's extraordinary. How could this be? For 125 years, scientists thought this site was, the, was only responsible for processing sound, and yet we saw that a typical healthy deaf person who was processing the same part of language that we know to be that same level called phonology, they too were engaging this tissue. This is the superior temporal gyrus. The superior temporal gyrus. And it's right here, it's in the left hemisphere. It's right above the ear. And what was so surprising is its location. It is <coughs> above the ear. That was even more reason why scientists thought, of course it's only for processing sound. It's sitting right there near the ear. We also knew that that tissue had no connection, direct connection with the visual cortex. So, this, so that was even more reason why it shouldn't be in deaf people. And yet this tissue was alive and well. In the next study, We took the brains of hearing and deaf people and we scrambled them. We scrambled the, <coughs> the, the images, these images, these are from the 
magnetic resonance imager, the MRI in England. We took the images and we scrambled them. And we flipped the left and right side of the brain in the images so you didn't know if you were in the right hemisphere or the left hemisphere. And what we found, so we then analyzed the volume of the gray and white matter in the sound tissue in the human brain. So it should be that deaf people have difference. They should, their brain should be different. Why? That tissue is not getting sound. Why isn't that tissue just shriveling up and changing and dying? Why isn't it atrophy? How is it that that tissue is not dying? What we found is that there were no differences in the brains of deaf people and the brains of hearing people. Look at this image. the primary auditory and secondary <laughs> auditory tissue in the human brain. The gray and white matter volumes are identical. Deaf people's brains are normal processing, using that tissue. And the reason why is that tissue is not dedicated to sound. This is the revolution and the insight. The tissue is not dedicated to sound. It doesn't matter that the tissue is sitting at the ears. The tissue instead is dedicated to rhythmic temporal patterning at the heart of human language, all world language. The rhythmic temporal patterning on the hands, the rhythmic temporal patterning on the tongue, it's not sound that's important. It's the rhythmic temporal patterning. Here's what we now know in science. We used to think, we used to think that sound, the ha so the question is how do children learn language? We used to think that children learn language, they had to hear sound, they had to hear speech. Then speech, the signal was shunted up to the motor cortex that then sent down projections to the area that controls the mouth. And then the child produced the maturational milestones that we see in development, babbling, first words, first sentences. We now know that's not true. We now know that the brain has special processors. It's like a car. You pick up the hood. Under the hood are many different mechanisms that make the whole car run. There's like a carburetor. There's and it, um, other things under the hood. <laughs> but each one of them have a job. And you don't want to do without the carburetor because the car won't go. It does its job to make the whole system work. The brain is built in a similar way. It has special processors. In particular, it has three that we know exist. They're called neural substrates. There's one that exists, and I talked about it before, the superior temple gyrus, that allows the child to discover the small, meaningless phonetic units in the world around it that will let the child get the basic units around which he will build his language. The second one, okay, the superior temple gyrus is here. Another one is the, it's called the left inferior frontal cortex. That permits a child to discover the meanings of words and the meanings of those small morphological markings that we do to embellish information on words. And then we have Broca's tissue, which is in between the two here. And that allows the child to find the patterns that underlie sentences. And those tissue, these tissue work in the deaf brain and the hearing brain identically. They're doing the same job. It's the same job in French, it's the same job in English, it's the same job in LSQ, it's the same job 
in ASL, it doesn't matter. The tissue is dedicated to the function of language analysis. The tissue is not dedicated to the modality, whether it's speech or hands. The human brain is, doesn't pay attention to the modality. It pays attention to the pattern. So here's some of the biological uh, conclusions. We now know in human language, in order to have normal human language, speech is not critical. We know that what is critical, what is critical, <coughs> speech is not critical, what is critical? We now know that children have to be exposed early in life, early in life to the patterns <coughs> of language because those swatches of tissue that I pointed out to you need the patterns to grow. They, it's like a seed and water of a plant. The seeds the child are born with, the water that the child needs is experienced with the patterns of language. If you don't give the child early exposure to sign language, that brain tissue won't develop normally. If you withhold sign language from a young deaf child, the, the brain areas that need their water are not going to get their water. And then you're going to be running trying to catch up with remediation lasting through early development. So the third thing we know is critical. And now I'll just take a few minutes to explain why and then wrap up. Early exposure isn't just early exposure to spoken language. No, it's early exposure to sign language. It can be speech and sign. The bilingual brain is a powerful, powerful thing. But it can't, it's not good enough to just expose the child to speech because the child needs the visual input to get the right unit out of the environment to get that brain tissue to start. It can't just be give the child speech because I'll tell you why. So now let me tell you about these, uh, uh, why is it that it's not good enough just to expose the child to spoken language early in life? Why does a deaf child have to have the sign language in the early months of life? To answer that question, let's just consider some of the views we have about deaf children. One is that deaf children have attention problems. A second one is that early bilingual exposure causes language delay and confusion. A third one is that early exposure to assigned language will hurt the child's development spoken language and will hurt their ability to learn to read in French or learn to read in English or any language. So let's just evaluate that quickly. We'll see that this is false. The child who is exposed early in life to visual language has visual attention advantages over the poor hearing child who didn't have the good fortune to have sign language exposure. The child who's exposed to two languages in birth, rather than being confused, has bilingual advantages over the poor monolingual child. Stunning bilingual <coughs> advantages, lifelong, right through to into um, geriatric development. In fact, if you're a bilingual, you have less of a chance to develop Alzheimer's than the poor monolingual. And finally, early exposure to sign language does not hurt the child's development to learn to read, but early exposure to sign language facilitates the child's reading acquisition. In fact, a child who's exposed to sign language, we have found in research that children exposed to sign language from birth as well as spoken language, so their bilingual input these are deaf children in the state of Maryland, deaf school for the deaf. The children, so it's the state of Ma the state of Maryland school for the deaf children, who were exposed to sign and spoken language from birth. 
will compare to monolingual hearing children. And the bilingual deaf, deaf children are outperforming the hearing children in the state of Maryland. They're outperforming the hearing child in the typical public schools in the state of Maryland. The subgroup of children who have had sign language and spoken language from birth are better readers than the children in the monolingual hearing, English, learning to read in the, in the school in the state of Maryland. This is a massive study, and it's uh, quite exciting. Okay, so let me just, the one thing I really want to make sure I leave you with is why the child has to have sign language uh, in early life. And that it's not, not good enough to just give the child spoken language. I've already told you that maturationally, the brain needs to have experience with the patterns of language within a particular developmental window. In addition, in addition to the brain tissue that needs those patterns, we know with early exposure to sign language, the child's visual system is changing. This is a stunning change. We didn't know this before. We thought the visual system was immutable. We now see that the human visual system can not only change in early life with exposure to the patterns, but it provides the child with advantages, processing advantages that go from low level visual perceptual advantages and take the child right up to higher cognitive advantages. Let me explain. The hearing and deaf child start with an equal visual capacity. If you massage that capacity, you can expand the child's visual analysis. But it has to be in the right developmental time window. If you miss that time window, then the child's visual perceptual analysis will narrow down. And we watch it and this happen in the brain. So it's the monolingual child who was born with a capacity for visual analysis, who over the first two years of life lose their, narrow down, lose their visual acuity that they would have had if they only had the good fortune of being exposed to a natural sign language early in life. So you, you could ask me more questions about this because I'm going through very quickly. But what we now know is that different early visual language experiences can change the brain. And they not only change the brain, but they change the function of that tissue. So a child who's exposed to sign language early in life has an increased visual processing function over a hearing child who never got sign language. So not only that, the increased visual sensory capacity gives these children higher cognitive advantages. Let me just explain why. The child who's exposed to sign language early in life has an increased locked visual gaze. By six months old, you can look at a videotape and you know this child was exposed to sign language and this one wasn't. Because the visual system changes. And the six month old is already boom, locked into eye gaze with the adult. Locking into eye gaze means when the parent signs, that's a ball, that's a ball. The child looks from the eyes to the referent, to the thing in the world, back to the parent's eyes. So the child has, these children have higher vocabulary. When the child has a higher vocabulary, all of you know this, what does the statistics say? What does the research say? Children with higher vocabulary have better language skills. Now those of you who are in reading research, a child who has high vocabulary and high language skills, what's the next step? The better readers. It's, it's uncontroversial in the reading literature. So when you give a child early sign language exposure, you are ensuring that that child will be a better reader than the child who is not exposed to sign language. Okay, let me just show you some of the data. These are children who were large groups of children who were deaf and, ex and not exposed to sign language. They were only exposed to spoken language early in life, as early as it could be because the patterns are not accessible if you can't hear them. These children have slower rates of spontaneous looking. 
They had slower rates of language and vocabulary. They had slower and lower reading and literacy skills. Then we compared them to deaf children who were getting signed and spoken language from birth. These children had faster, more frequent shifts than eye gaze from the object to the name of the object. So that built their vocabulary. They had stronger, uh, that led to stronger later book sharing and literacy skills. They had stronger vocabularies. They had stronger language comprehension. And in addition, a side benefit from having the early exposure to sign language is this. These children had more advanced self-regulation. They were socially more. Anybody who's a teacher, a teacher of young deaf children, can pick out the kid who's from a native family signing and pick out the kid who was deaf and not exposed to sign language. Which one fidgets more? Which one do you have to say, pay attention, pay attention, over and over and over again? It's because the child did not get experience with the visual language that allowed the visual systems to develop more fully and did not get the experience with the phonetic units by which they can build a stronger language capacity. Okay, so very briefly, I'll discuss just two more findings. The age of... <coughs> So there's this other view that you have to have early exposure, uh, that early, I'm sorry, early exposure to bilingualism hurts the child. And I'll very brief, this is summarizing 20 years of work. The bottom line is, is that the age <coughs> of first bilingual exposure predicts the bilingual mastery, the child's reading achievements, the child's language achievements. The earlier you expose a child to two languages, like sign and speech, the earlier you expose a child to two languages, the more powerful the benefits that are to these children and benefits that last a lifetime. <coughs> Early bilingualism strengthens, re strengthens reading, not the reverse. Strengthens the language capacity, not the reverse. It strengthens their higher cognitive abilities, not the reverse. In fact, the United States military knows this. Their $27 billion stealth bomber, they only let bilinguals fly it because bilinguals have higher cognitive advantages that make them faster at rapid processing and multitasking and switching back and forth because it's a spillover cognitive benefit of having two languages in which you switch back and forth between the two languages. You definitely want a bilingual controlling your local nuclear power plant. <laughs> <laughs> and you definitely, when I get on an airplane, I just listen, oh my God, I hope he or she is bilingual because they're gonna fly that plane better. Um, so, another thing is uh, views that, uh, common views that are wrong is that early exposure to sign ostensibly hurts spoken language development. This is a big one. This is probably what you are hearing now because there's an evolution in the types of views that are expressed. And a very popular one now is getting very sophisticated in neurospeak. So I've had doctors explain to me that, oh, you cannot expose a child to sign language early in life because it's going to hurt <laughs> speech development. It's going to hurt reading. And, a, and a, a, a more recent one is that it's going to hurt auditory tissue development in the brain. And this is a very important one to evaluate. If this were true, we'd have, you know, we'd, we'd have to stop and take pause. So let's look at this a moment. Uh, I have no idea why that one's wrong. Oh, okay. Um, uh, what we found is that early exposure to two languages provides important brain benefits and reading advantages. <coughs> and this is important that it's to, you, to both languages. Another thing is we found that 
early bilingual exposure provides benefits to a monolingual child who's then educated in a bilingual context, that that child from a monolingual home who then goes to a bilingual school is actually getting stunning benefits. <coughs> and I can discuss each of these findings, but the, all the citations are there. Another thing we found is that we've compared the different types of bilingual schools. Some are very strongly sequential. Some are simultaneous in the sense that the children are exposed to the two languages within the same developmental period. It doesn't mean at the same time. This is not SIMCOM. This is not TC. No, 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 no. It just means that in the day, the child will have exposure to sign and the child will have exposure to speech. and or the child will be exposed to French, and the child will be exposed to English, or English and Spanish, whatever, that in the same developmental time, the child's getting exposure to two languages. This provides powerful advantages, powerful cognitive reading advantages, higher cognitive advantages over the monolingual child. Uh, and finally, uh, this is the, will raise and answer the question, about does exposure to sign language hurt auditory tissue development? This is the newest research, and I'll just summarize it briefly. We're using brain technology that previously didn't exist. The technology allows the person to sit up, to move their hands, to move. The previous studies were done in those huge MRI machines. I don't know if any of you have seen that. You, it's like you, you, you get strapped down and you're rolled into the donut. And you can't produce sign language. You could just press a right button or a left button that says you know yes or no. So you're making receptive, passive judgments. We try to give people active tasks, but you're still limiting language investigation to analysis of reception. This permits analysis of the full complex of language, production, reception. It also allows us for the first time in history to really study the developing brain babies the moment they're born, to track them over lifetime. We can put this system on the brains of young babies and we can track very specific brain tissue over time. So we can see a deaf baby's superior temple gyrus. Is it functioning? Is it advancing? Is it going through the same maturation as a hearing child? And we're able to see that their answer is yes. So now let's just look at this study. It's the last thing I'll, I'll talk about. The claim is that early <coughs> exposure to sign language hurts auditory tissue development. Let's test this hypothesis. The hypothesis is that this tissue was slated to be auditory processing. <coughs> And that if you give the child early visual processing, it'll get into that tissue and push out the normal sound processing functions of that tissue. Either it'll push it out, another way it's been articulated as the sign language will, it's very powerful language, will colonize the tissue. That's the word that's been used in neuroscience, that sign language will colonize it. So this is very, very strong. Let's consider this prediction. The prediction is that early exposure to, so let we have a young child, the child has a cochlear implant, the child is not exposed to sign, the child only gets drilled in spoken language, only spoken language. We then have two groups. We'll have a group of children, I'll skip to we have a group of deaf, young deaf adults that are around 18 years old. They were born deaf, 
got cochlear implants very early. They were not exposed to sign language. <coughs> we're going to compare them to a group of children who were born deaf and immediately exposed to sign and sp they got I'm sorry they got a cochlear implant and immediately they were exposed to sign and spoken language. So what's the what's the prediction here? The prediction is that the deaf young adults who got an early cochlear implant and no sign should have more normal use of their auditory cortex. They should have healthy, normal use of their auditory cortex. See it again? They were born deaf. They had a very quickly a cochlear implant. No sign language was given to them. Only spoken language instruction. The prediction is that those people will have the most normal auditory tissue development because sign language was withheld. If you compare them to the group of people who had early exposure to sign, well, given the theory of colonization, then the auditory tissue in that group should be atypical. We found the reverse, absolutely the reverse. The normal auditory tissue use, the normal <coughs> auditory tissue was in the children who had Early exposure to sign language, early, and early exposure. They had a cochlear implant, and they were immediately given sign language input, in addition to speech training. Who had the most atypical tissue? The deaf adults with the cochlear implant, and very late. Late means the day they arrived to Gallaudet, they're 18 years old. So they basically had no exposure to sign language their whole life. They only had, they were only drilled immediately in speech. They only were in oral, strict oral, oral programs. They had no exposure to sign language. They, that group, had the most deviant auditory tissue use as compared to the children who had the early exposure to sign. Why is that? Because that tissue is not auditory. That tissue is temporal. It's it, Tissue doesn't want, it's a misnomer. We mislabeled it. Science was wrong. The tissue is not exclusively dedicated to sound. The tissue needs language patterns. Guess what? The patterns are on the hands as much as they're on the tongue. The brain just grabs it, goes, and grows into a normal brain. It's the people who have had the patterns withheld that have the deviant tissue. So this is very uh, exciting. I've already told you about the visual supply <coughs> phonology just here. When you give the child the early rhythmic temporal patterning of natural sign languages, this tissue here becomes stimulated, basically turns on. It lets it do its job, so any of the rhythmic units in visual language that fall under that rhythmic temporal undulation it helps the child find the beginning and the ends of signs. Helps the child say, oh, that's a sign, and that's the transition, and then that's a sign. From that, the child can find the little phonetic units on the hands and build a visual sign phonology. And from that, when they learn to read like a hearing child, rather than mapping from a sound unit to the black squiggly line on the page, the child just maps from the hand unit to the black squiggly line on the page. Because the child has a phonology. It just is in a different modality. And what we find, this is a really exciting finding about our species. The phonological level of language organization is universal to this species gets pushed out onto the hands or pushed out onto the tongue because it's coming from the human brain. An implication for teaching children reading is that if you married the child's visually based and sound based phonology, you can wed this in a stronger reader. So you can have ASL or LSQ rhythmic rhyming 
or ASL or LSQ, rhythmic poems or rhythmic storytelling, you will facilitate the child's phonetic analysis and you will help this child be a better reader. So what have I said today? I've um, uh, talked first about visual attention, bilingual language development, and then early reading acquisition. I've said that early exposure to a visual language actually gives a child benefits instead of, it's not even that they're as good as hearing children. They're better than hearing children. It gives them advantages. Early exposure to two languages is absolutely optimal. It's brain food. That signed and spoken bilingual exposure gives the child lifelong language, reading, and literacy benefits. And that building the visual phonology, the normal, healthy, natural visual phonology in a young deaf child actually gives them stunning reading advantages. So why have these views the common view? So the common views are wrong. The views that are held in society are wrong. Sign languages are not biologically inferior. Speech is not special. The brain actually could care less. It doesn't care if you give it hands or tongue. It wants the pattern. So that means that sign languages are biologically equivalent to spoken language. So why is it that these common beliefs exist? One is that more information is desperately needed to educate doctors. Go look at a typical medical curriculum for a doctor and just see how many hours of child development that's required. You would be shocked, stunned, virtually. I mean, the last I looked, it was four hours of child development to get an MD. So it's important to look at this. This is changing and it varies in different schools. But I can identify a whole host of medical schools that require, you, you're going to be an MD, four hours of child development. Let alone do they know about a deaf child's development. I would say zero. So we need to educate doctors and clinicians. More information is needed to educate parents. Also educators and policy makers. It's an important, it's very, also it's very important that those of us who do the basic science are totally committed to the translation of science to society and to engage in a two-way discourse with the community because you know so much. You can teach us about the developing deaf child. And we have to open that dialogue. So what are some of the policy implications of what I said today? Number one, the first policy implication that I see, it is an imperative that our governments remove discriminatory practices. Do not withhold sign language instruction from the young deaf child. Number two, early bilingual language exposure provides bilingual reading advantages, provides reading advantages that are remarkable and um, inexcusable to withhold children from that incredible benefit. I mean, we spend all this money buying our babies, baby Einstein toys. Throw the toys out. Just give the child early bilingual exposure and you pay, you'll get your benefits and your dividends far greater than paying, you know, $100 for a baby Einstein toy. Require research findings to be available to parents will require research findings to be available to medical teachers and medical, medical practitioners, teachers and policy uh, holders. So what I've said is that the revolution in our understanding has to occur now. Uh, um, I summarized in sum 40 years of my own work and 56 years of the field's work. I came in about 16 years into the field. I worked with Bill Stokey. I understand the issues. From I went from language revolution to the cultural revolution. 
We're now ready for the bi biological revolution. We have unequivocal evidence that speech is not special. It's language that's special, the patterns in the human brain that are special. Biology has taught us that the status of sign and the status of speech are entirely equal. The brain processes both equally in early life and provides stunning higher cognitive advantages to the species. We also know that about the bilingual advantage that I told you about. And this puts a new perspective on this thing. There's, a, there's an expression called food for thought. And it, it helps us re-see, re take a new fresh look at this notion of food for thought. Who in this room, raise your hand if you would starve your child. <coughs> Who would starve their child of food? No, we don't do that because we know what will happen if you starve your child of food. You cause physical damage to your baby. What would happen if you starve your child of language like you starve your child of sign language? You will cause damage to the human brain. So let's, this is just a visual representation of what I'm saying. Sign language and spoken language are food for the brain. If we wouldn't withhold food, milk, from your child, you cannot withhold language from your child. Early visual exposure is a biological imperative. And it will remove the devastating impact that we see of children who have minimal or no early language experience. Thank you. Thank you. 